this opportunity while I've got um, there's a whole collection of editors here, some of whom are not editors of our well, society journals. Mm. But <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say how appreciated the job of the editor is. Certainly on behalf of the OR Society, I would like to say to OR Society editors, thank you. You do a fantastic job for us. The journals are really important to the society, to the community, to the ecosystem of, uh, of OR and its surrounding, all the surrounding disciplines. And that goes actually for all journal editors. I just want to thank all of you, especially the old, but, but just <laughs> to publicly say they do a fantastic job. Do ask challenging questions, but they are really valuable to us. And thank you very much. And thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Indeed, I'd like to uh, present the editors uh, to you. So we've got. Um, Professor Tom Archibald, who is uh, editor of the Journal of uh, Operational Research Society, Robert Dyson, a emeritus professor from the University of Warwick, who is the editor of the European Journal of Operational Research, and uh, Professor Mark McCarthy, a uh, European editor of the International Journal of Production and Economics. Professor Gilberto Montevallier, um, editor, area editor of the Journal of Thematic Criteria Decision Analysis, Professor Stuart Robinson, um, who was founder of uh, the Journal of Simulation and he is here in, in, to represent the journal in, in place of the current editors. Professor Dov Tenney, uh, editor in chief of U Journal of Information Systems. And last but not least, Graham Rand, editor of the OR Society's Impact magazine. Um, so what, I'd like to thank you very much for accepting our invitation and to be sitting on the panel. Um, now uh, the plan for, for this session will be that the journal, the journal editors will be invited to give a very brief two-minute presentation about their journals and to provide some idea of the scope and uh, how, how it works for the journal and then we will be opening the floor to you, to the attendants, to ask questions and to initiate the debate. So it all depends on your questions. Right, so uh, to start off with, I'd like to invite uh, Tom to uh, give you an idea of the Journal of Operational Research Society. Okay, um, thank you very much for coming along to the session and extending what already been a long day at the, the conference for many of you. Um, so just a, a few words about the Journal of the Operational Research Society, um, about this slide. Um, I don't think it says too much um, that you wouldn't know already, but basically George aims, like any um, large operational research uh, publication, to publish the latest academic research in operational research and to publish that to a broad international audience and to do that as quickly as possible. Um, so I've put a couple of graphics there to make the slide look a bit more interesting and also to emphasize that international sort of aspect. So what these two um, charts represent are on the left hand side the geographical distribution of authors publishing in JAWS over the five year period 2012 to 2016 um, and you can see the large number of um, countries that are represented there um, and then on the other side distribution of authors who cited works in JAWS over the same period and again we can see a, a large um, number of countries represented there so we you know clearly JAWS is getting out to <coughs> a uh, large community of international users. I've e emphasized a few words there. I mean, academic research is an academic journal. So we're publishing um, academic research and getting to an audience of academic users who are then citing the work um, and so on. Um, George aims to publish work that's relevant to theory and practice. Um, and I mean, this can be a little bit contentious. Um, challenges we have there are we don't get many case studies submitted um, to JAWS, and some of the ones we do um, simply report the application of an old method to an existing problem and comment on the results that were obtained. Um, and what reviewers would typically want is more insight that would actually inform um, the operational research or the process. We want to learn something about the actual process, which will have more general application, and that's quite often where case study papers sort of fall down. 
So we're very open to publishing case studies, but we need to have them submitted, um, and they need to do something which will have some sort of general applicability. Um, the very last point I wanted to make was that we've been around for a very long time, so since 1950, the longest operational research uh, publication. Thank you. Um, you can see from the you can see from the slide that uh, there are actually six editors of, of, of Injure, and uh, the way we work is that uh, as papers come in, they just get diverted to one of the six editors, depending on the keyword, the key, leading keyword. So there isn't a, so there's no hierarchy at all. We do have an international advisory board who help us out in difficult situations. Um, but as you can see, with them. Um, 3,000 odd submissions a year. Each of these editors is handling about 500 plus papers a year, which is 10 new papers a week. So as I'm standing here, probably with the papers just coming <laughs> going on. Um, we're very international, and you can see that the, the editors are all different parts of Europe, but the advisory board is from all parts of the world because we get submissions from as the jaws from all over the world. Um, there's a few. Figures there about impact factors and so on, but if you're really interested in that kind of thing, you can look it up on, on your leisure on the on the EGOR website. Um, but uh, we're, we're quite a popular uh, journal in many different ways, although we haven't been going as long as yours, of course. We, um, we have four categories of papers, invited reviews, and uh, we, 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 we Good invited reviews are really useful to the OR community, I think, and they get well cited. And so if anybody out there has got a good idea for an invited review who feel they're really on top of the field, then we'd be interested to hear from them. We do publish application papers, but, but like yours, there's got to be some novelty in there somewhere. I'm keen to publish papers that relate to practice, um, but that's be some novelty. It could be in the process, it could be in the technique, uh, might even be in the application area, maybe. Most of the papers fall into the theory and methodology class, and uh, we uh, we publish right across the span of OR, from soft OR at one end right through to the more mathematical, computational, computer science thing parts of OR at the other end. So we have a, a full range of papers that we are willing to uh, consider for each OR. And we do produce some short communication, but they, we only want short things that relate to a recently published EGOR paper, perhaps putting it right, or perhaps adding some crucial twist to it. Thank you. I'm European editor for the International Journal of Production Economics. A um, couple of points. We're in the same stable as EJO, so we use the Elsevier system. Um, and we get uh, something like half the number of submissions that uh, EJO gets. We are covering, to some degree, a subset of EJO's territory uh, on the boundaries of technology management, production economics. <coughs> and operations management. Um, this is the blurb on the website that tells you what we're about. Um, what does this mean for the kind of pub papers we publish? Well, we're a pretty broad church. We interpret production pretty widely. So we include papers, for instance, on a number of areas of healthcare and production. Um, but we are much more picky on the types of papers. Um, and the, the types of studies and the methodology. Uh, for instance, uh, an example I often give is lean production. Uh, we would be interested in a paper that uh, looked at the impact of lean production on uh, the profitability of firms, for instance. 
we wouldn't be as interested in the paper that looked at how to, how to do the production well, that was largely descriptive or qualitative. So even though we publish a lot of qualitative work, we like it to have a fairly hard edge. Um, our death reject rate is getting up to 60%, which seems like a lot, but our overall acceptance rate is about 12 to 14%. So get past that first base, and you really have improved your chances of being published. Um, we are slightly unusually organized in that I'm European editor. We have a Far Eastern editor, uh, and we have a, a North America, an America's editor. Um, I should also say that um, the way we're organized uh, is something we're looking at currently uh, because of the volume of submissions. Um, even though Bob wasn't going to talk about impact factors, I just make a play for our journal that we're, all our metrics are pretty strong, including the newer metrics. And in fact, we were on ABS 3, uh, but we made a, an application to ABS last year to be upgraded on the basis that our metrics were smack bang in the middle of the four, four star journals on both the management science and operation and operational researchness and the list that we're in, operation and technology management. And interestingly, as European editor, for some reason I also cover Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> and we get a lot of papers from Australia and New Zealand, partly because on their list we are a four journal. Um, I'm happy to talk about ISEA. Any questions you may have on the journal? So I'll hand over to the next person. And general of mitochondria decision analysis. Okay. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, so the journal of MCDA is uh, linked to the International Society of Multi Criteria Decision Making. It's a niche journal, it's a small journal, focused on decisions with conflict objectives. And we publish, we want to be very, we are very international. Mm -hmm. And we publish not only kind of research but also applications and evaluations uh, out about multi criteria decision analysis. He has published some key papers in the field, so for example, the very prestigious Informed Decision Analysis uh, Best Paper Award was awarded to one of our papers in 2009, uh, Abbas and Madison. Uh, we also published the Widely Practice Decision Analysis Prize. Valentina, for example, has won in the past. And uh, some seminal papers like the Rifle's paper that started MCDA in, in the United States. Um, in terms of citations, again, we are a small journal, but our site scores are increasing. So we have a site score in 2016 of 1.33. For comparison, ITORS, which is a well established journal, is at 172. I mean, some, of, some of the journals here are much higher, but again, we are a niche journal. Accept acceptance rate, rate is just below 20%, and we have this year, last year, we had 156 uh, journals, to, uh, papers to, to deal with. So it's a small road compared to yours. And they are listed in the Web of Science as an emerging source uh, so far. And the journal is composed into all the areas of MCGA, so from value and utility to outranking, AHP, and uh, multi objective optimization. Uh, and, and so on. So if you are working on MCDA, if you have strong research we, and applications, we encourage you to, to submit them. It's a good outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I, I am the charlatan here. I am not editor of the Journal of Simulation uh, anymore, but I, I'm here because uh, I was uh, jointly founded the journal um, some 10, 11 years ago now with Simon Taylor from Brunel University, and I acted as, as editor of the journal for, for, the first, uh, for the first five years. So I probably should tell you who, who the editors uh, now are. I've got it listed there, but Christine Curry, Southampton University, is the editor-in-chief. And she works with Lou Hay Lee from uh, Singapore and John Fowler from Arizona. 
uh, which gives you a sense of the international reach of the journal. It is an OR Society journal, but very much has that broad, broad scope uh, internationally. They, they, we aren't organized in any sense that they, they cover regional areas uh, in editing. They actually share the editing of the, of the papers based on, on their individual expertise. Uh, the journal um, obviously, and obviously publishes uh, in the simulation field specifically, but it has moved since its original inception, which was very much focused on discrete event simulation. Over the years, uh, we introduced more and more work around agent-based modeling, and more recently uh, in system dynamics as well. So we, um, papers from any of those areas are welcome. We focus broadly on techniques, tools, methods, technologies, and the application of simulation. A, a strong driving interest is, is in applied work or work that can demonstrate application but as part of that as well, uh, we will publish uh, more theoretical papers, but in general, the preference is that those papers then demonstrate uh, where they could be applied. There is also a, a stream of, of technical notes in the paper of shorter, shorter in the journal, shorter technical notes. Uh, and, uh, a few uh, key statistics. Um, one thing I think we're very proud of with the journal is um, we actually got an ISI rating after six years, who any of anybody who's gone through that process will know that it is not possible to get an ISI rating, uh, a citation index until five years of existence, and so therefore we pretty much got it straight away at our first application. That's quite unusual. Uh, our, our citation scores sit at around about the one level. I haven't got the latest figure with me. Um, Number of submissions per year, around about 160, constantly going up. We produce four issues per year, um, and the acceptance rate, the latest figures, was at 29%. That actually was higher than I was expecting. It, it varies to a strange figure to try and derive, and if you look at it year on year, I think it bounces around from the high teens to somewhere around about 30%. Uh, certainly, desk reject sits at about 40 or 50%. One of the things I always enjoyed as an editor uh, was the fact that uh, one of the ways of rejecting a paper was just search for the word simulation in the paper. And we did get papers without the word simulation in them, which was fascinating. So if you want any piece of advice, actually send it to the journal. Yeah. Don't send the paper not about simulation to the journal simulation. Um, at present, time to first decision, around about 54.2 days, but of course, that is skewed by desk reject, which is a very quick process, of course. Uh, so, so once you get past desk reject, it is a little bit longer than that. And time to final decision is currently, on average, about 150 days to, to get final decisions. I was, um, I am the odd man out, but uh, all these guys are men, and uh, so I just wanted to correct the bad impression. And we do have, as you just heard, some of the OIS um, journals do have women uh, editors. Um, <coughs> the reason I am uh, an odd man out uh, is because we deal with information systems and not OR. And it's a bit of a split personality. If you see, uh, we do belong to the OIS, but we live in a community of IS researchers. And our main competitors or main uh, world of publication is something called the Basket of Eight, which are the best eight um, journals in the field of information systems. We're one of them. If anybody has a sense of uh, these other journals, some of them are based in Britain, like ISJ and JIT. That's what, basically what we do. So I'll just take a couple of minutes, uh, two, three slides, to show you what the world of uh, IS is 
from the perspective of an editor in uh, an IS journal. So <coughs> this might look very fuzzy to um, other journal editors. But basically, this is our vision. Uh, EGIS is a distinct place for discussing rigorous research into meaningful IS problems. So anything that hasn't got, uh, that hasn't any uh, relationship with IS, of course, cannot be uh, published here. It doesn't have to be in the title, but um, that's what we aim for. But look at the uh, second, um, second sentence here. We seek relevance and impact. Diversity is extremely important to us, so we've got a very diverse board, very diverse genres of um, publication, and um, definitely the, you can see the authors and um, um, content is extremely diverse. I say this because um, I want to really invite you and get your interest in at least looking at the kind of articles that we have so that you can um, submit your own uh, work. And it has to be interesting. Minor detail, but it's important to us. Um, so it, when I came into the uh, office, the main um, idea was really uh, to function as a kind of gatekeeper and select the best or the worst um, material. But very quickly, we, as a philosophy, of the entire board, we're committed to it. What we do is really seek the promising papers, and again, our rejection, our best rejection rate is pretty high, but the ones that remain uh, get our full attention, and we go through a, a very serious uh, process of developing the paper. That's really my main uh, commitment as an editor. And, so, and I'll, I'll just use this as the final uh, slide. What you have on the left is uh, more or less the regular um, uh, paper review process or life cycle. Uh, you know, answer queries, that's what I do a lot. Um, this is not to invite you to send a lot of queries. I waste a lot of time on that, but I think um, that that's uh, part of my responsibility and I stress that because of what we heard earlier. You need to read the journal before you submit. You need to know the journal before you submit. And too many people don't do that, don't bother to read articles, um, not just the instructions to the author, but read the articles to get a flavor of what we're looking for. Uh, screen submission, look for fit, is extremely important to us. Composer, review panel, but this is the traditional. The way we do it is on the right hand side. So um, <clears throat> we have uh, basically three editors, including myself, managing editor, and what we do is we look for the fit, and the rest is um, rejected. Uh, we're going to have a senior editor uh, right now. We still don't have that functionary, um, and the AE has, relative to many other journals, a lot, a lot of autonomy. So the AE's recommendation, recommendation is nearly always um, on it. And of course we have reviewers from all uh, around. Uh, these reviewers are charged, as I say, with helping the authors to develop a paper. So people who are looking for a quick acceptance uh, Aegis is not, it's not their cup of tea. So um, I just want to put it flat on the table. We look into a process that usually takes about three quarters or a year to fully develop a paper. So I'm uh, glad to answer any other questions. Thanks. Thank you.
case that we're ending up with. So, now for something completely different. Impact is the Our Society's magazine. It's not designed for our society members. Members do receive it, and uh, the other reason it's an audible app is that I'm assuming that this is a magazine that's read. Um, uh, but uh, <laughs> it is designed for people who are not in the OR, the analytical community. I hope our society members find it interesting and encouraging and uh, motivating, but it's designed for people that are outside that community in order for them to see what it is we can do, our relevance and impact, to use the phrase on the previous slide. But we're trying to get across to people that we're doing great things. And so what I'm looking for is stories of work that um, have been implemented, where we can get quotes from the satisfied clients uh, and uh, so on. So it's, uh, it's, I, I, it's so long ago since I uh, wrote this that uh, I forgot what I'd written. Well, it doesn't really much matter because what's there is what I may or may not be saying for what I'm telling you. But this is today's truth. So I'm looking for uh, articles that, uh, that can demonstrate the impact of operational research or analytics. One of the ways I do to try and find people to write for these things is actually go to listen to conference papers. So if you see me in your presentation, be worried, be very worried, because I'm on the lookout to ask people, I've already called one person uh, today to say, don't you think this good story could be told in the, uh, in the impact? Um, so most of the articles are actually commissioned by me and I hear a talk or I read about something and I go after the, the, the potential authors but not all there are some that people write in I've got a good story to tell is it the relevance to impact and uh, we seek to work out whether that is the case and if it is then we follow that through there is another mechanism. You don't necessarily need to write the article. We have some professional writers that we employ, um, and they will write the article for you. This isn't necessarily less work, uh, because it's different work. They will want to talk to you. They will want some of your written report that's relevant, or slides of a presentation you've given, and they will meet you or phone you, have a Skype conference with you, and then they will write up. Uh, they're, they're professional writers who write up the articles. So, very different. Get your story out there. It's for the good of the community. This is an outreach magazine. We need to hear decision makers. We get, try to get that to people who are going to make decisions about employing people like you. So, it's in your own interest to make an impact. Thank you. So, um, you talked uh, a brief introduction um, from all the editors and uh, now I'll um, uh, ask you to participate by asking your questions. I will be passing around the uh, uh, microphone because this is a, um, a session that is being recorded so I'd like you to wait for me until I get to you. So um, from here on I would like to ask you any questions. Hello. Uh, journals have very precise instructions about the format you have to follow uh, before you submit your paper. And it can, you, you have to go through all these steps and make sure that everything is uh, according to how it should be. But then, if it's best rejected, all that effort was wasted. And then, you've got to look at another journal and change the format, and look at all their rules, and make sure that the reference is in the that order and so on. Is it what matters in the first stage, the content, and then getting the format right should be done after the papers are accepted, not right at the beginning, because then you end up having <coughs> to mess about with formats every time you send it to another journal. Good point, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> We'll see if we can change the workflow. Yeah. Any, any other comments? 
<laughs> Use LaTeX. Some of your journals have this your paper, your way type thing, don't you? Well, where it is more freedom in, in the first submission, which is good as well. And I think he, he draw does that, don't you? Is it called your paper, your way? Well, El Elsevier have it as a. Um, the so they, yeah, they, 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 they say it, but most of the journals actually are quite picky yeah. <laughs> for the submissions. So. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, I think that there is a reason because if, if you're not, if you're very far from the right formatting, so particularly references mm -hmm. and so on, it's impossible, you know, it's very difficult to unpick whether the paper meets the standards required. Um, I, I think there is some attitude. Uh, and certainly, I review papers for journals where it's quite clear to me it doesn't quite match the format. And it's obviously got through that far. And as an editor, I would have let stuff that wasn't, you know, didn't check everything to the nth degree. Um, but if you're too far off, it's just not going to be possible to judge the paper. And I would say, I mean, we, we've all, I think, given quite high figures for desk reject. But one of the things I found as an editor, I was absolutely shocked at how poor some papers were. So when we start talking about desk rejections, uh, you might be shocked to understand to, to know just how poor some submissions look. And all of the, if you're making a serious attempt at a paper that is associated with the journal, you, you are very unlikely. You, will, you may get desk reject in some cases, but it is nowhere near the 50% level that we're talking about. There's an awful lot of dross that comes through. I think there's a certain set of information that you know, a journal might use in a certain way. So if, you know, keywords might be used, for example, to select associate editors, um, abstracts might be used in a certain way. So having that information clearly labelled and, you know, is appropriate. So I think to that extent, different journals might have slightly different styles. Um, but I don't think it would go down to whether it was double spaced or space and a half or margins and things like that at the initial submission stage. I just add that uh, to, to make sure that you are to some degree abiding by the journal's rules on length. So if you if the journal has a say ten thousand word limit uh, and you are submitting twenty thousand words, that's noticeable. But submitting eleven thousand words is probably not going to be uh, a reason for death reject unless there's a, an administrative process in there checking. And the other point I would say is referencing is critical. So as an editor. If I see poor referencing or lack of referencing, that's often a reason for death reject. So, uh, or missing references. It's surprising that you know that, that could be just an indicator of quality. Also, a technical issue for most journals with online submission: always check the PDF that's generated before you press submit. Uh, that it's readable um, in the form that's that's generated. If not, go back and check what you've submitted. So just a few checks on length, referencing, and readability. Yeah, and I think, I think Chris, the editors have a difficult job without having to read the real hard paper, so they don't get through our technical process. Um, if it gets there, then it's rejected on some other grounds, and maybe you uh, just put the wrong journal in the first place. I just wanted to add that we, um, for already a one year, I fully agree with what you're saying. Um, for one year, we've introduced a template for a cover letter, and, and that cover letter is supposed to um, that cover letter is supposed to include all the pertinent information that we need, and the information that helps us choose um, the associate editors. And I think that's um, partly would um, would help your your difficulty and overload of um, work, but. Uh, the idea um, of saving time before submission makes everybody a little nervous. Um, so, you know, we put in so much effort into, for example, uh, developing a uh, paper, or even before we desk reject it, um, that we expect, I think, some um, level of um, investment to each submission anew. That's the other, the other side. Oh, sorry.
Yeah. Well, maybe uh, late tech is a bit of a place to learn, but once you learn it, then it's easy to change. I mean, if that's a, the problem, it's easy to change from IT. Mm -hmm. from, well, it's relatively easy. So I think that's, uh, if, if that's an issue, that, that, that's the way to go. Well, so I know it's good, too. <coughs> but I think what he said is true. I mean, if, if people don't bother even to, to do the formatting, you know, should us uh, spend a lot of time revising the paper. I think bad formatting is a bad start. So, thank you. It's clear that some investment in time and in checking what the general is about is quite a key message that our entities are giving here. So we'll move on to the next question, Nicholas. Um, so this is a question to all on the panel, but I'm particularly interested in the response by the editors of Future and Jobs. Uh, I wanted to ask about special issues, whether you um, publish them or whether your policy has changed, whether you encourage them, and then what is the process of proposing uh, one, and what makes a good proposal for a special issue? Yeah, I mean, yes, we, we publish special issues, and uh, I mean, the, the process for proposing them, um, if you have an idea for a special issue, if you contact uh, one of the editors, and discuss your proposal with the editor. We do have um, a set of sort of guidelines for people wishing to publish a, um, a special issue. Um, and for example, <coughs> we would expect uh, the special issue to include a review article of the area, which can either be written by the editors or commissioned by the editors. Um, we would want the area to be contemporary. We want to know why it was the right time for that kind of special issue. Um, we want some assurances that there weren't similar special issues recently appearing um, in, in similar journals. So we'll discuss those sort of things and, and move to corporate papers. One of the hardest things with special issues is, is getting out kind of regular supplies. What we tend to find is that you don't get any, it's, you know, similar to buses, you don't see any for a long time and then five or six <coughs> at once. And then that's difficult because you can't really, with 12, issues of JAWS in a year, we can't really publish five or six special issues in a year. So we, I think you know one or two is per year would be a sort of reasonable number. So we do have to manage the, the supply a little bit. So if a lot come in at once, we have to prioritize and, and so those issues there. Do you expect a proposal up from, from to be fully fleshed out or is it just, in, just a query first and then? I, I think it would be reasonable to, to put in a query first, say the special issue in this particular area. Um, and these are the reasons why we think it's interesting and timely at present time. Um, and then if we're, if we're interested in it, um, then we'll come back and, and work out our proposal from there. Uh, we, um, we have a number of special issues on the go at the moment, uh, two or three or four. We always take one from each Euro conference recommended by the Euro program committee. Um, but apart from that, at the moment, we've actually suspended any more special issues until 2020 because we've got such a strong flow of papers that we don't, even though we produce 24 issues a year, we feel at the moment that uh, we, we, we don't want to crowd out people who, uh, who don't happen to be in a special issue. So we do, we do, we do, do special issues, we have published some very good special issues, and no doubt we shall do it again, but at the moment we, we're having a pause for two or three years because of the volume of stuff that we do. I think that was oh, <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know why it wasn't asked, but I want to answer. Um, because part of what I'm doing is trying to um, get your attention to um, our journal. And we take special issues as a great opportunity to do um, interdisciplinary um, topics. And, and that's where I think a combination of IS people and, for example, right now we've got project management or data analytics or any such combination for us is an excellent recipe for um, a special issue. But going back, we, we really do require investment in effort and time. So I just finished a special issue proposal with somebody, and it took us around four months just to clarify what exactly we want. Uh, just to add to that, yes, we're, we're, we're interested in special issues. We've published quite a number. Uh, it, 
requires a full proposal, um, which we evaluate as an editorial team. And we're asking the question, why? Why a special issue on this topic? We're particularly interested in who the proposers are um, and whether they're of sufficient standing, really, to, to both generate uh, the number of papers that are required. The kind of basic mistake that many young researchers make is to uh, propose a special issue in the latest hot topic. But of course, uh, there's not sufficient research uh, done for it to kind of to, to merit a special issue. Um, so we reject a, a lot of the special issues, but as I said, we are particularly interested in who's proposing, uh, and often we will recommend that people bring other people on board. Uh, people can underestimate the amount of work. I mean, we, we know how much work there is in editing journals, uh, but many special issue proposers don't realize that if they get, say, 60 submissions, which we had for one special issue recently, that's a lot of work to be handling. And uh, you've got to realize that it's, uh, it's uh, a significant time commitment. As you'll realize, all issues of impact are special. John Fokker, editor inside OR. All our issues are, are special as well. And we have a reject rate of probably less than 10%. But it would be nice to receive something from you as members. It is your magazine. Please send us something we can publish. Uh, there was another request for Arthur. Um, Arthur, you mentioned that you have a Uh, it was interesting today, um, attending lots of the sessions, to see the diversity um, that's presented and actually the opportunities that that then gives us in terms of authors as to which journal should we be targeting. And I come from the information systems domain, but I see a lot of topics and a lot of presentations here today that I think could equally sit in information systems, but are clearly at an OR conference and there's an OR preference. So I wondered what opportunities are there for the editors to give sort of allow to ensure that we don't dilute good research debates that might occur that I'm sure the editors would like to flourish in their journals by having that, where should I put it, how should I position my research, which journal is, is, is best placed for me to, to publish. And if I'm looking at topics around big data <coughs> analytics, data science, there's an awful lot of overlap between information systems and OR. I just wonder how the editors are responding to that I suppose almost potential duplication or sort of confusion about where should we be looking for our insights here? Are you referring particularly to analytics or? It could be analytics, it could be a big data. Um, sort of it, big data analytics requires an information system to allow it to flourish. So the two are, I see it very much entwined. <clears throat> Again, it comes back to um, what, what I'm doing here around this table, I guess. Uh, we had uh, once a discussion at the Publications Committee. Um, I mentioned one of these um, issues in, in relation to health systems. And um, I, I got a submission that I thought was more appropriate for health systems. And the way I decided that I First of all, I, I gave the details and, and forwarded it. Is um, that uh, we are very concerned with the impact. I think somebody mentioned here um, you know, the need to address impact. Uh, so, for example, with data analytics, if the topic is um, one that is more concerned with the technique, how it was developed um, to prove or to show its uh, efficiency, etc. Uh, then probably it's less um, less fits, let's, uh, let's put it that way, aegis. But if it's um, more on the impact and how it changes behavior, changes the uh, organizational uh, processes or behavior, then we very much like it. So what I'm saying is, in fact, 
um, a particular project, research project, might actually have both outcomes and could publish in both journals. So I think it requires uh, some minimal level of coordination between the editors. And we've discussed that. Um, we should take it probably a step further. Thanks for the comment. We, uh, we publish a very wide range of papers. And I think, I think for example, if it's in analytics, I mean, I think at EJOB we'd be looking that the paper was aimed at the operational research community and not at the information systems community. So I think it's up to the authors to decide who they're trying to target. And if it's clear that they're aiming for the operational research community, then we'll give it serious consideration. I do get a number of, some of the desk rejects I get are where somebody has got a topic that potentially is operational research, but they haven't bothered to cite any operational research, you know, no jobs, no e job, no nothing. And they're not writing for the oral community. Um, so I think it's hitting the community, that making sure that if you say to e job, you're aiming it at the oral community and not the information system and, and vice versa. But isn't that perpetuating the silos? No. That, that, that approach? Oh, I don't think these are silos. Uh, no, I mean, oh, wow, versus, versus the rest of the world. <laughs> no, no, I think, I, think, I think the OR community, I think if you want to relate, I think if you want to relate to the OR community, then you should be having some rationale for doing that. That doesn't mean that it's got to be within a certain boundary. It might be pushing the boundaries, and most of the papers I deal with are pushing the boundary, and I suspect I put papers through the process that some of my editorial colleagues wouldn't if it went to them. Um, so I'm very happy to push the boundaries, but not if it's, you know, it's a paper that's just listing 25 economic no, journals. <laughs> I'm not going to bother with it, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I mean, I agree entirely with that, really. It's, it's for the authors to explain why the paper is relevant to the audience for JAWS or whichever journal submitted. Um, and it has to be clear in the paper. And the, you know, if it's, if it's obviously a contagious issue, then the authors have another opportunity. I mean, it's got to be clear in the paper, but in the covering letter that they can submit as well, they can also reinforce the point that they think the paper's relevant to this audience for these, for these reasons. And uh, certainly as an editor, I'd be open to, to hearing those, those reasons and, and make a call on that. And then it's up to, ultimately, it's up to the, to the referees to, to make the final call. A quick comment. Um, having, you know, I agree, but almost every, even though the views are conflicting, I agree. With all that. Um, but what, uh, what I would say is, we're all interested in interesting papers and papers that might be cited or might be leading or moving in a new direction. Uh, so try us. Um, uh, I'm sure I speak for everybody here. We're we're prepared to take a punt on something that looks sufficiently interesting. This is partially linked with the previous comment, but also with the concern that I've, I've noticed that a couple of editors had when they were presenting their journals. It concerns me, uh, particularly case studies, because my impression is that most of the applications that are submitted, they are not very real, they are not very interesting, and nothing can be derived out of them except that it was successful. So they apply something into that, something that is not very realistic, they get some results, and they say it was very successful. So I think if you think about applied work, it's very important that it goes beyond just reporting what was on. And it has proper research design rooted on case studies and with findings that can be related to similar findings and that can be, to a certain degree, extrapolated beyond the case study. And I think the OR Society has a long tradition of, of strong applications, but I think we are missing a trick here in terms of turning these applications into strong research papers. But this really requires hard work and a kind of aim of turning this into, into serious, serious research. Thank you. And um, we have one more question. Uh, Professor Kaiser, Professor Kaiser, Professor Kaiser, Professor I suppose it's when you receive a paper, a, 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 submit a paper, and then after the first um, uh, revision, you receive a second comment from the reviewers. And those reviewers are conflicting with each other. Sometimes two reviewers are not less accepted, and then third reviewers are happy with more uh, revisions. So I wonder how the editors, uh, if they have a strategy to, to deal with it. Sometimes very difficult to, to 
please um, do the changes that uh, will um, satisfy the, the comments of three or sometimes four years. <laughs> Nobody wants to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a go. Um, well, I mean, this is when the editor earns their crust, and it's a pretty small crust, I have to say. But it's really what our jobs are about. It's, it's uh, you know the the you know two or three uh, reviewers saying reject. That's easy for us. Two or three reviewers saying accept or uh, looking good, that's easy for it. It's, it's that kind of 60% in between. The judgment I make really in asking authors to resubmit is whether I think they have a chance of being able to do it successfully. Uh, from reading the comments, do I think that, uh, these, that this paper has a, a reasonable chance, for instance, if uh, one of the reviewers is asking for more work and I trust that reviewer, then I'll probably move in the kind of reject. Um, so inviting you to come back a second time in my case would be, unless I specifically say um, this is a borderline decision and it's up to you, and I would occasionally say that, but uh, if I'm coming back to you a second time, I expect the paper to... You know, to, to end up being published in some form at a, uh, you know, down, down the line. So um, I'm sure I can speak for everybody. We hate rejecting papers that are late in the kind of rounds of reviews. Yes, I mean, uh, I was referred to it a little bit there, but I think, remember the editor has a sense of which reviewers perhaps they trust more than others. Um, so there is maybe within that some sense of hierarchy. So if you've got that sort of decision and they're coming back to say we think there's a chance of this being published, it's probably an indication that the reject decision is being outweighed by the other, the other reviewers. It, you'll also sometimes get a bit of a clue, and I've certainly done it and I've seen others do it, which is we think you should take most notice of the comments from. And that also gives you, you know, never going to turn around and say, Ignore that reviewer; it's rubbish. Um, <laughs> but though, well, I say that you may sometimes find you don't even see that review, and certainly I've had in some cases some pretty shocking reviews come through as an editor, and I've actually basically got rid of them before. You know, so it, it just you can even uh, you wish to send them to anybody because of uh, poor reviewing practice. Um, but so look for the clues. I think the answer, because it will give you some direction as to what you should take most notice of. And of course, we do invite uh, authors that are to revise. We invite them not just to follow up reviewers, but also disagree with the reviewers if they feel that way. When it gets really a tough decision, I usually try and get one of my advisory board members to uh, to referee it for me, which might appear as a fourth. Uh, <laughs> well, I always use. I need to always use three referees because two always disagree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got one more question. Thanks very much. This isn't for Graham, it's for anybody else who wants to answer it. Uh, several uh, of the editors have said that the, uh, the journal's looking for examples of uh, practice or things that are relevant to practice, uh, looking for impact. Um, how do you see the journal articles reaching practitioners? If I can pick an answer to that first, I mean, I, I'm not sure that the journal articles necessarily will reach practitioners directly. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, incentive now, particularly in, in the UK, for authors to generate impact from the, the research, and I think there's, there's other sort of mechanisms for uh, generating impact out of research articles. So I, I really feel that most of the academic journals are for an academic audience, and I think authors should be trying to translate the results of those papers into a form 
which may come in something like an impact magazine or a similar publication that would be more readily accessible for uh, practitioners in order to sort of generate the, the impact that way. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think the whole bit of the audience seems great and where media you know, has been again in the impact That would certainly be a lot of this. But yes, we, I mean, I look for papers in journals and then see if I think there could be a story uh, made out of it. One last question, I think. I'd be interested to know if you're seeing any trends at the moment in in journals and, and whether you can extrapolate that forward. Uh, so are there differences that you're seeing happening? Do you foresee in the next sort of five to ten years? website that looks at historical trends and, and you can see how things have changed in terms of keywords dropping out and new keywords coming in and so on. So there's a half an ounce if you look on the uh, EGO website and there's a paper published for its 40th anniversary or whatever anniversary it is at the moment. I meant more in the, in the strategic management of a successful journal. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I, I would say uh, the pressure to publish is, has never been higher, and it's not just in the UK, it's globally. Um, so far more papers being generated, far more um, uh, kind of submissions to journals are going up. Um, but I do think that the whole publishing world is going to change. And one question we should ask ourselves is, you know, what is the role of the publisher? Um, we do the work, we write the papers, we review the papers, um, and they appear in journals that publishers charge our uh, universities to have, our university libraries. And many people think that that, that model is broken. Uh, and in fact, in some disciplines, disciplines like uh, biology and some of the medical disciplines, uh, basically, uh, you know, the, the role of the publisher is fundamentally uh, being challenged. So I think 10 years hence, the landscape might look quite different. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> there's one, um, I think, key aspect that's going to change, and probably m many more, but one is um, besides this competition that we need to... Um, we need a fight to get into, for example, in our case, financial uh, 50 or what used to be 45. Um, besides that, um, that uh, need to compete, uh, the way we compete, I think, is going to make a difference. And, and one key aspect to that, I think, is going to be much more of a dialogue than a one way. Because if you look at the new generation of today, the millennium, um, they expect and those are our PhD students today, they expect to be part of the process and they expect to be part of the dialogue. So what Ruth mentioned uh, um, uh, about how we communicate to industry, that's also going to be um, how we communicate amongst ourselves. So the, the papers are not going to be the printed papers anymore, for sure. They're going to be much more of a platform for dialogue and, in fact, the review process is going to be um, very much uh, a dialogue rather than the wise men, and, and that's already happening, by the way, in IS and, and uh, human-computer interaction fields. Um, so it's not going to be a one-way, uh, this is what the wise men said, and you have to abide whether you like it or not, and if there's one uh, reject, and the paper is rejected, that's how some of the journals operate. Uh, one reviewer, the whole paper is rejected. But much more of uh, opportunity for the submitter, the author, to argue his case, get revisions and get feedback, um, and again, uh, submit. And it's not 
the, the, the three or four months waiting for what the wise men said and accepted to say. That's, <coughs> not, that's not going to be the future. We'll leave one more question. Yeah, this is not a question, it's a comment. <laughs> I have worked with Graham twice on, on pieces for impact, and I want to say to tell everybody what a pleasure it is because you get to tell the story without having to cite this and cite that. <laughs> and he's a terrific editor for helping you to make something that's a bit more journalistic. So thank you very much, Graham, and I encourage others to, to, to submit things to it. Well, I'd like to uh, thank all the editors for giving all their answers to the questions. And I'd like to thank you as well for asking your questions. Now, in between um, this time and, um, and dinner, there is a little bit of time. So if you wanted to talk to any of the editors individually, I'm happy. I'm sure they'll be happy to uh, talk to you for a bit. Um, for me, thank you for attending.